Thank you, Pastor Mallory, and it is nice to be here. I remember those days, uh, they would give him to me one day a week, and I would keep him as late as I could. You remember that? And uh, I'd lost track of Pastor Mallory for quite a while, a number of years, and our lives moved on, and... and uh, it's really a pleasure for me to be here, and we had a good time talking about war stories yesterday, and uh, we both have gone through some difficult uh, pastorates, and we are still here. And uh, just let me tell you one thing. He said, John, I only remember one thing you told me. <laughs> and here's what it is. I said, remember who you work for. Because in a ministry, you're treated so many different ways, you're bound to enjoy some of them. <laughs> so you as a church member, you're not going to get off the hook. You have a stewardship. You have a ministry in your own sphere. Just remember who you work for. So anyway, so much for that. I didn't know a good friend of mine, Pastor Milton Halleck and Margaret was here. And uh, I knew them in, uh, well, nowadays it's pre-flood. <laughs> and uh, I did have a good time visiting uh, Elder Wampler and Betty. And I didn't know uh, Elder Jeff Wilson was a member here. I've known him for a number of years. And you may wonder, well, what does a guy do in stewardship at the North American Division? If you guys will bring up uh, my NAD stewardship website. What we do is produce resources. For example, uh, uh, no, that's just, let's leave that one, let's see. Okay, let's go to uh, our video clip. This is uh, NAD stewardship. There's a lot of resources there. And we're going to go down to, where does my offering go? This is only a minute and a half. Birthday thank offering. Where does your birthday thank offering go? Take a look. Usually on your birthday, you get a present. But in church, many people give a gift on their special day. It's called a birthday thank offering and will tell you where it goes. Have you ever given someone a thank you gift? Maybe they watched your cat for a weekend or sang a song at your wedding and you just wanted to show how grateful you felt. Well, church members sometimes make a gift of pure gratitude to God. It might be on the occasion of a birthday, thanking God for the blessings of the past year, or maybe to thank Him for one blessing in particular, such as a promotion at work or a new grandbaby. They mark it on their tithe envelope as a birthday thank offering. So what happens to the birthday thank offering? This gift is directed to church divisions outside North America to do mission work. Much of it is used in evangelistic activities, but some also goes to clinics, hospitals, and educational institutions. A portion of your gift goes to administer the General Conference Mission Program, helping move missionaries into new fields to advance the Adventist message. So your gift of gratitude goes to missionaries and church institutions around the world who in turn will accept it with gratitude. It sort of shows that being thankful can be contagious, doesn't it? Remember, fund the mission to finish the work. We're in the process of putting a lot of minute and a half, two minute uh, video clips to describe and define all the different offerings that uh, you have opportunity to give to in the North American Division. And there's a lot of other resources. If you go there and dig down deep enough, you'll see a story by your pastor 
that I recorded on uh, uh, video at uh, General Conference. And it's a good story. You'll have to go there. Uh, here's something else we produce. Go to uh, stewardshipjack.com. Anybody heard of Stewardship Jack? Few people have. Uh, he's my dog and my wife's dog. And we have a children's church. We have, he has five books. Actually, this dog is more famous than I am. And uh, uh, we are in the process of uh, creating a movie for children on the topic of stewardship. It's a strong movie that a mother and father can let their kids watch it all day long. You don't have any innuendos of supernatural. You don't have all this kind of stuff that seems to creep into movies for kids. And we hope to have that done by uh, sometime this fall. But uh, here's a little music video. We'll just play a short clip of it. Mr. Jack is a good old dog. He loves his family. He loves to fetch and run outside, chasing squirrels up a tree. When it gets dark and bedtime comes, good old Jack is there. He puts his paws up in the chair and says his goodnight prayers. Now Jack has a black fur coat and two brown eyes to match. He is so willing. You can go to the website and finish that song. Uh, that's me singing. I wrote that song to go with this. And uh, along with the children's church, there's even a songbook with CDs that the kids can learn uh, the, the music to it. It's also in Spanish. And uh, you know, what else do we do at the North American Division as far as stewardship is concerned? Well, I'm involved in making sure the offering appeals get to the local church. So we have people write them. I write some myself. And also, uh, 2018, first quarter of 2018, you're going to have a uh, Sabbath School Quarterly on the topic of stewardship that I wrote. I've written the companion book. We're going to have a feature-length movie that goes with it. And uh, so today, you're going to get a little glimpse of that uh, uh, Sabbath School Quarterly. Uh, but uh, I'd like to... See how you do with some music here. Sins 
will kill me And I don't know just what to do I open up my heart to Jesus The great I am is gonna see me through I'm going there to see my Savior I'm going there no more to roam I'm just a go over Jordan. I'm just a go over home. I'm just a go over home. You okay? There's nothing I like more than coming out in a dignified, somber manner, as stewardship directors must do, and play that guitar. <laughs> totally unexpected, right? <clears throat> uh, I'd like to do one more, please, from the tape. Track 16. The shadows grow dark Oh, accept this sweet peace So sublime Sing with me Peace, peace It's wonderful peace Coming down from the Father above Sweet peace
Well, I got so much to say, I don't know how long to take. You know what that is? Do you think I would give it to you? You think I would give it to you? See that? You think I would give that to you? <clears throat> this? <laughs> You're right. <laughs> okay, since you believe, you've answered 50% of the questions to get this. The next question. I'm going to give it to you. Do you believe, provided you answer this, do you believe I can tell you where you bought your shoes? Um, probably not. You don't believe I can tell you? No, you guys stay qu be quiet over there. Who influenced you? You got your shoes at a shoe store. All I'm saying is this has some power. It's not ultimate power. It's a demigod. It has some power, but not supreme power. Amen. This is called brain candy. And you can't get enough of it, can you? I want to raise. I don't like the tax bill that I've got. And on and on and on. It's costing too much to go out and eat. The, the uh, cable is too high. I want to suggest to you that this is the God of this world. Actually, it's the facade that Satan hides behind so you don't see his true identity. People kill for it. People work hard for it. People think they are entitled to it. And you and I, part of God's church, are not immune from it. What's that text in Revelation? We are increased in goods and need of nothing. And that means both physical and spiritual. Stewardship is defined as the management of tangible and intangible possessions for God's glory. So I'm going to talk about the tangible. This stuff. If this is the God of this world, you'll find that there is a sophisticated system around the God of this world, just as stewardship is a system. In our persuasion, I did some research, and the uh, researcher said, we as Seventh-day Adventists have a sophisticated view of stewardship, but we're lost in the big picture. I was reading on the internet. You can find anything on the internet. But one theologian was saying the reason we are not in the kingdom, he is not of our persuasion, but he said the reason we are not in the kingdom and that we have so much trouble in the church is because we don't know and understand how to implement stewardship. I'm biased, that's what I talk about. And I can't explain the topic in... 30, 40 minutes. But I can introduce you to a concept. You see, God has only one competitor in this world. One competitor. He said, you cannot serve God or mammon. But you and I deal with this. 
If this is the God of this world, materialism is its religion. And you will find three pillars of materialism in the temptations of Christ in the wilderness. But that's another sermon. What is materialism? Materialism means I've got stuff. I like my stuff. People in this country, we want stuff. I've traveled around the world a little bit over in Bangkok and Africa. I've seen uh, extreme poverty, extreme wealth, but the rest of the world is catching up. They like stuff too. And I bet if we went to some neighborhoods, you would find, uh, well, coming into the airport Thursday, I saw trailer courts. No garage. You go to another neighborhood, there's a one-car garage, another neighborhood, two-car garage, another neighborhood, three-car garage. Then you have to go to storage units. Do you know what's in a storage unit? Junk. Did you know that you folks have miniature storage units in your house? If you allowed me to go and look, I could open this dresser drawer or this cabinet and I'd find junk. There are bits and pieces of your emotional life that you do not want to get rid of. Stuff, that's materialism. Oh, before I forget, trust in the Lord with all of your heart. What that means is the heart is the center of wisdom. And if you have any wisdom at all, it needs to be influenced and molded and, and manipulated in a positive way by the divine creator of the world. Amen. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart, all of your wisdom. And sometimes we do stupid things with our money. And lean not on your own understanding. Money's the God of this world. Materialism is its religion. And I'm saying, trust in the Lord with all of your heart. That's the, that serves as a bookend for the beginning of this talk. On one side. Trusting in your own wisdom is like leaning not on your own understanding. To lean on my own understanding is like I'm going through life making decisions and I'm using crutches. Don't allow yourself to be your own crutch in making decisions. Money's the god of this world. Materialism is its religion. Consumerism is the sanctuary that we gather in to worship. You think, what do you mean by that? What's the difference between consumerism and materialism? Consumerism is not just stuff. Consumerism is more stuff. You can't get enough stuff. They push it at the end of the year at a holiday season, and they start the holiday season earlier and earlier and earlier. They want you to buy stuff, and you can't resist the allure of that stuff, and we go buy. This afternoon, I'm going to tell you how to make a budget for your Christmas. It's absolutely easy. And by the time this sermon is over, you're going to say, John, you're preaching to the choir. And I find that when people come to church, if you're the choir, some of you need to practice because some of you can't sing. <laughs> and I'm not talking about music. I'm talking about managing your life. Money's the god of this world. Materialism is its religion. Consumerism is the sanctuary that we gather in to worship. When did consumerism really start? Around 1955. 1955 was the zenith of Adventist giving. Per capita, our giving and tithe has gone down every single year since then. It hasn't missed a single year. That just simply means fewer and fewer Adventists are giving more and more dollars. We cannot sustain that, folks. And I'm not talking about money. I hope that Jesus will come through this message. But I'm also talking reality. 
And if you think that is the case for us, the regular Christian world is in financial crisis. Well, no wonder they say tithing is part of the Old Testament, Old Covenant, and you don't have to do it. 58% of the Christian world, I read it this morning, so you don't have to do this. Only 56% approximately of our own persuasion return a tithe. Look what God has done with what we have given him. That's astounding. Just simply astounding. The footstool of consumerism. It's a house. Started selling houses big time in the late 50s, middle 50s. People had a home. Hey, we've got to have stuff in our house. The retailers had the stuff. How do we get our stuff from a store to the house? Automobiles. And then how can we get people to fill up the house? By television. So you have the ingredients of consumerism. Home, automobiles, and stores. And that's when our tithing per capita started going down. Just a thought. In all of this stuff that you and I face, please, I'm going to repeat this over and over. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart and lean not on your own understanding. So money's the God of this world. Materialism is its religion. Consumerism is the sanctuary that we gather in to worship. Television is the evangelistic arm of materialism. The, the, the retailers know that it works. They have ads on television that are designed to get you to buy the merchandise, and they, they, they influence you in such a way to have a delayed response. If you're watching television late at night and you see an uh, advertisement of a pizza on the TV and you have one in the refrigerator, you're, you're inclined to go get it because you're made up of two parts, intellectual and emotional. And your emotions really drive your intellect in this culture that we live in. It's like a person riding an elephant. The elephant is our emotions. The rider is our intellect. But Scripture seems to say, I want the intellect to govern the emotions, but they drive the intellect. And we could talk about television some more. So money, but I'm going to move on. Money's the god of this world. Materialism is its religion. Consumerism is the sanctuary that we gather in to worship. TV is the evangelistic arm of materialism. Now be careful with this next one. Sex is the mysticism of materialism. What do I mean by that? Well, retailers understand this very clearly. Let me give you some illustrations. Here's a car, a Mustang, 425 horsepower Mustang. How fast do you think it'll go from zero to 60? Well, how fast do you need to go? from zero to 60. Oh, they're sweet. In traveling, I rent cars, and they gave me one to drive. I took a picture of it. Hey, Jan, here's my new car. In that commercial of that car, here's a person. And there's chemistry going between this person and the car but there's really no relationship whatsoever between this person and that car. But that chemistry comes across the screen, across the printed page, and we are susceptible to that. And retailers know that it sells, but they don't call it the three-letter word. They call it the concept. Now, the Christian world understands this, and they've done their own research, and they know that they will get more money to their local church if they let women take up the offering. How do you like the culture we live in? I was looking at the internet. Listen at this. It's a commercial. Young man, young woman, 
They're making eyes at each other. They're twirling around across the living room and flashing the product they want to sell. And they go through the doors, and she's kind of hiding. And he opens the doors, and he gets the girl. And the last thing on the screen is they're trying to sell a water faucet. They know it works. Materialism is the religion of this God of this world. Consumerism is a sanctuary we gather in. Television is the evangelistic arm. Sensuality is the mysticism of materialism. Do you know what mysticism is? Mysticism is, oh, I sense a divine being. I'm going to empty my mind with syllables. Mm -hmm. Mysticism. And some people will say your relationship with Jesus is a mystic experience. Okay, maybe it is. But I don't like it if it is. Because I want a real relationship with Jesus. If your relationship with Jesus is mystic, you're done. You're absolutely done. But the whole world, that's what they're used to. We've got to have a real relationship with Jesus Christ. But we're not done. You know, materialism has a religious side to it. It's called prosperity gospel. Prosperity gospel is simply saying, if I return this to God, I give this to God, I am guaranteed he's going to give it back in a greater fashion. And that's not true. I don't give to God to get. I give to God because this is a matter of simple honesty. Oh, how about this? Um, prove me now herewith. The old King James. I understand the now. I understand the me. That's God. The herewith, that's kind of connecting things together. I'm left with prove. Let me take you to logic 101. An atheist says there is no God. If he says there's no God, he or she says there's no God, that must mean there was a God. Because how would the atheist know there's no God if there never was a God? You don't have to tithe, which means you probably should, there's that concept. So how would a person say, no, you don't have to do it unless that concept existed? Now, logic 101 is going to fall apart. So there's a second part to, one, to logic 101, and that is the evidence. So part of it is intellectual, and part of it is the evidence. Do you see evidence of God? When you return your tithe and your offering, that is your statement, personal statement, that God exists. And nobody in their right mind would do such a thing. But your mind has been captivated by the Savior of this planet. Amen. And that's okay with me. He can have everything I have. He's got everything I have. You know the fires in East Tennessee a few weeks ago? I had a cabin there in the family for four generations. It burnt to the ground. Emotional loss. At the same time, relief. I do not have to work on that house or cabin anymore. Right. Oh, trust in the Lord. 
with all of your heart. And lean not in your own understanding. We're not done. Materialism, money's the God of this world. Materialism is its religion. Consumerism is a sanctuary we worship to get in. TV is evangelistic arm of materialism. Sensuality is the mysticism. Prosperity gospel is the religious side. There's a personality disorder, and I'm not talking about the kind that requires medication or, or psychiatric care, but it's called narcissism. <clears throat> if I had millions and millions and millions of this stuff, and I came here to talk about how to get rich, this place would be packed. This stuff will make you think you are somebody you are not. It seems to me those were the thoughts Jesus said about a certain angel. An angel thought he was someone that he was not. But that's the culture of this world. Oh, we're not done. I have more gloom and doom for you. Hoarding is the futility of materialism. And again, I'm not talking about the psychiatric situation that needs professional care. I'm just simply saying when you identify yourself and your identity is wrapped up in your possessions, you got a problem. My identity is not wrapped up in my guitar. When I play the funny looking guitar, people think I'm cool. Where do I want my, my identity? I have no other place to go. I want my identity wrapped up in the life and character of Jesus. Amen. And so many times I feel like a total failure. But if you ever fall, don't fall away from the cross. Fall toward the cross. That's where a steward goes. Money's the God of this world. Materialism is its religion. Consumers, is, have you heard enough of that stuff? Let me just go on to the next point. People say that giving is the antidote for all of this soup that you and I face. But I want to suggest to you that giving can be corrupted. You can corrupt the gift and the giver. I was pastoring a church. Stand at the door and shake hands. I never understood that little formality thing, but uh, I'm not going to stop, so please, uh, I'd love to shake your hand this morning. But this man came out he didn't own a particular brand of car. He owned the company, the dealership. He had lots of money. I'd preach the best I could. He would come out with tears in his eyes. He'd shake hands and go on his way, and I would open up my hand, and there's a $100 bill. It happened so many times that I said to my wife, I need to pay attention to the door he leaves so I can get there quicker than he does. <laughs> you can corrupt the gift, you can corrupt the giver, you can corrupt the recipient. So giving is really not the antidote. I've heard tithe, returning a tithe is the antidote for selfishness. Yes, it strikes a nail in the coffin. But there are people that tithe because it makes them look good in a congregation. Makes them look good in the community. So here's the antidote. What I think. And here's the other bookend. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your understanding. And here's the other bookend. Zechariah 4 verse 6. It is not by might nor by power, but 
by my spirit. That's the antidote. What does it mean? It's not by might. It means a great army is not enough to save you. This church is not enough to do for me what I need done. This congregation is not enough to do for what each individual person needs done. With all the years of experience and all the life of commitment here, the scripture says, it's a mighty army. It's not enough. It is not by might nor by power. By power is referring to a single hero like Hercules. The Romans would return tithe to Hercules. Nebuchadnezzar returned tithe to his gods. The Egyptians returned tithe to their gods. On the night Babylon fell, one researcher said he seemed to indicate that when Belshazzar was losing the kingdom, he brought in all the stuff from his captivity, and, and they were suggesting he may have been trying to return back tithe. And then the researcher says, we don't know where they got this concept. I know. You go to Genesis, and there's this crusty old guy named Abraham. He finds Melchizedek, and he tithes the spoils of war just like the heathen do. But the difference with Abraham is who he tithed to. I don't have to explain all that stuff. That makes a difference. You don't tithe and give offerings to your church. It's to God. He's the one that says where it should go. By the way, if I were to ask you, what is the purpose of the tithe? Many would say, well, let's pay the pastor. Yeah? Yeah, I, I do that. I live by the tithe. And if you happen to be a person that doesn't like tithing, I'd trade places with you and see if you live on how you like living on holy money. What I understand is when I return my tithe, that's a symbol to God that the rest of what I have has been dedicated to Him. So you live on holy money as well. That ought to make a difference on some of the things we spend it on. Forgot my point. Senior moment. You'll get there, Mickey. <laughs> what do I do with this stuff? It's my decision. It reveals, hey, what you do with wealth has a direct bearing on your relationship to Jesus Christ. Amen. We as Seventh-day Adventists are not the only ones that teach that. Saddleback Church teaches that. And a few other places. I was reading where this is staggering 90% of Mormons tithe we're at 56% I have some John Matthews theology for you here's my opinion if all Adventists were faithful Jesus would come back all faithful in tithe, Jesus would come back because it is a statement of faith. I've been told in the building where I work, oh, that's just a transaction. No, it is a statement of faith in who I believe in. Zechariah 4 6. Two stories. Some of you I told this to, I think, last night. I was listening to 
Adley Campos. Her husband was the publishing director of the General Conference years ago. She's retired, but she still preaches and does ministry. She was preaching and giving the devotion to about 700 leaders of the North American Division a couple of weeks ago. She was talking about stewardship. And at the end of her sermon, devotion, she said her husband one day brought a man down into the baptistry. And as he prepared to put him under the water, the man held up his fist and didn't let it go under the water. And after the baptism, he said, why did you hold your fist up out of the water? And the man said, I didn't want to baptize my money. Read the story of Sam Houston. He had his money baptized when he was baptized. President of Texas back in the 1800s. But let me tell you my story. I'm a little kid. My dad's an Adventist preacher in the Southern Union years ago. He had three churches. He would go to all three on Sabbath. I would say, Dad, would you please make the last one short? <laughs> but one day, I'm sitting at the table at lunch after the first, uh, second church we had been to that day, and we had to eat fast to go to the next one. He said, Johnny, did you see the man I baptized today? I said, yeah, Dad. I wasn't really too interested in the story, but I've never forgotten it. He said, well, Johnny, the man came into the baptistry, and I baptized him, and he went back up the steps, and he turned around and said, hey, preacher. In the South, pastors are called preachers. Other parts of the country, they don't call you. I was introduced one time as the right reverend Dr. John Matthews at an Episcopal church. I couldn't hardly speak after that. <laughs> but in the Deep South, they call you preacher. He said, hey, preacher, the water didn't hurt my money. My dad said, what are you talking about? And this man, somehow in that robe that was soaking wet, clinging to him, he fumbled around with it, and he pulled up. <laughs> he said, preacher. He opened up his wallet. He said, the water didn't hurt my money. My dad says, why did you bring that wallet and money into the baptistry? He said, I wanted my money converted. Amen. Is your money converted? Because it has a bearing on trusting in the Lord with all your heart or leaning on your own understanding. And the only way to deal with that is not by might nor by power, but by the Spirit of God. Oh, by the way, 4 o'clock, right? This afternoon, I'm going to talk about some more stewardship. Income, expenses, assets, and liabilities. Most everybody here probably could be out of debt, including your home mortgage, in 7 to 10 years. What does the Bible say about that? It's a whirlwind. Hour and a half. Hope to see you. <laughs>
securely cradled in your arms, I can make it through. When storm clouds gather over me, I will seem so dark. I will find my rest in you, the keeper of my heart. Sometimes I can lose my way with dark clouds over me. Light that once seemed so bright now I can't see. Then gentle arms surround my soul, causing the storm clouds to part. Darkness soon gives way to the light from the keeper of my heart, keeper of my heart. I will rest in you, securely cradled in your arms. I can make it through When storm clouds gather over me My world seems so dark I will find my rest in you The keeper of my heart Yes, I will find my rest in you The keeper of my heart everyone would open to hymn number 524, Tis So Sweet to Trust in Jesus. And everyone stand. <clears throat> I just want to mention to you this afternoon at 4 o'clock, John will be back with us. 
And I, I just want you to know this afternoon, he's going to talk about some practical things. One thing, uh, if you had questions about how this all works, he's going to explain a little bit about what they're doing with technology in the North American Division to make this easier for you. There's just a lot of good stuff this afternoon. I'm not sure if we're going to stream it yet, but uh, if you can't get here, you can check. Uh, I don't see a thumbs up upstairs, but I think there is a thumb upstairs. I see it. So. Uh, uh, so, but yeah, we would love you to come, and then he's going to open it up for Q&A, and so if you have any questions, you can ask those questions then. Let us pray. Father, thank you for blessing Pastor John today as he spoke to us. The message is very clear. We heard it, and now it's our choice to do something about what we heard. Father, we know that there's a real battle going on. The enemy of souls, Lord, he's working overtime. But thank you so much for the promise that says that greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. And so it's by that strength, not by our might, but by thy strength, the Holy Spirit, the strength of your spirit, that we move forward as we attempt by your grace, Lord, to be faithful in all that we do. Protect us now. Give us all a safe trip as we go our separate places. And Lord, bring us back this afternoon for some more good stuff. Thank you for hearing our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.